also focusing on the whole thing without losing efficacy. Uh, welcome, Dr. Parveen. So I would now request Dr. Dinesh Tarwar to take over and request Dr. Mohit Dogra to join us here. Hi, uh, Is Dr. Zaheer Abbas there? Dr. Zaheer Abbas? I think what we are going to be discussing today is extremely important because any management of ARMD finally relates to trying to increase the interval between treatments. The longer the interval, <coughs> the better it is for the patient. The question is, how far are we down this path? How much have we uh, achieved? And what left to, is left to be done? And for that, we have Dr. Praveen Sen, who's a senior consultant at uh, Shankar Netrale, and she will be discussing about Q16 and about what do we know today. Um, over to you, Praveen. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dinesh. Dr. Chetra, could you join us, please? I thank uh, the AIC Scientific Committee and uh, our, my panel here for giving me this opportunity to present something which really interests all of us and I'll try to show the scientific angle to it. And uh, we know that uh, with the advent and with the discovery of anti vegf this has been a game changer for treatment of age-related macular degeneration. And from 2006 onwards, when we first started the anti vegf therapy to the present times, we are still striving for new therapeutic targets, increased durability of treatment, reduced treatment burden, and improved anatomical outcomes. So with anti vegf first time Anchor, Marina, Harbor, and vegf Trap, all these view one, view two studies, we first started talking of improvement in visual equity. But down the line, when we came up with this trial, seven years down the line of use of anti vegf what happened? So even after seven years, the patients who were enrolled in Marina or Anchor, which were the earliest studies of anti vegf we saw that almost 68% after seven years also had active exudation, 46% were still receiving ongoing anti vegf treatment, and the moment they were out of the clinical trials, almost one-third declined by 15 letters. So new vascular AMD is a long-term disease and it requires consistent treatment to maintain visual outcomes. If the suspension of treatment is done, within the first year, 41% will have recurrence, and after five years, almost 80% cases will recur. And the eyes which resume treatment after having a recurrence have a permanent vision loss of more than three to five letters. So for treatment of new vascular AMD, the most important thing is prompt diagnosis, treatment, proactive individualized treatment, and continuous long-term treatment in spite of the optimized burden that increases. And this is quite significant, not only for the patient, but also for the caregiver who has to bring in the patient every month for OCTs and checkup and injections. And for the society, it increases the cost of treatment and durability of the chosen molecule. These are few questions we have to ask ourselves and answer to the patient all the time. So it is a challenge to maintain the neovascular AMD treatment efficacy while reducing the clinical visits. Aflibercept with its binding capacity of almost 100 times that of ranibizumab, as well as the fact that it inhibits VEGF as well as the PGF dimer, it definitely translates into a longer duration of action and reduces the uh, frequency of injections and visits. So to test this hypothesis, we had the VIEW1 and VIEW2 study, which was a large phase three study of more than 1,200 treatment night patients, 300 patients in four arms where they tested 0.5 milligram of four weekly, two milligram four weekly, 0.5 milligram of four weekly, and two milligram of eight weekly aflipercept. So these were the four arms which were seen, we, and the results were evaluated at 52 weeks as well as 96 weeks. So this is a graph that I have taken from the study. It has shown us that the patients who received uh, any of these four arms, they did gain significantly where the visual acuity was concerned, but the eight weekly arm did not lag behind in the gain of visual acuity as compared to the other four weekly arms. 
And if you look at the central retina thickness, you can see the graph below, and you can see a little bit of zigzag which is seen. That means fluctuation of CRT was seen in the eight weekly treatment, but visual acuity did not uh, falter. And this fluctuation became even less when we looked at the second year or the 96 week results. So here you can see that the visual acuity gains were comparable in all four groups, including the eight weekly treatment arm. And this was seen at the end of one year and two year. And importantly, the number of injections came down. While in the first three arms, there were almost 12 injections in a year. In the last eight weekly arm with aflibercept, we had 7.5 in the first year. And in the last year, only at the end of two years, only 11 injections, which means actually five injections lesser than the monthly arms. So approximately 90% of the uh, patients in viewed study could maintain the visual acuity at the end of uh, 52 weeks, and 48% of the uh, biweekly or uh, of the eight weekly arm also maintained quarterly doses, and they were able to maintain visual acuity even with a reduced number of injections. View one extension study looked at this number of injections for almost four years, 212 weeks, and they saw that though the, it was a capped uh, injection that every 12 weeks they should give the in, uh, injection, at least the patient should receive it. The visual gains were good and uh, the number of injections did come down. So the visual gains even at the end of four weeks, even with once an injection in 12 weeks, it was reasonable. So this gave us the confidence to go into a treat and extend kind of a proactive uh, treatment regime for our patients with AMD so that fewer injections can be achieved. The Altair study looked at the difference in the two-week uh, extension and the and four-week treat and extend study, and this also had almost large number of patients, 247. Here they did treat and extend at two-week interval and treat and extend at four-week interval, and they uh, have seen that the visual equity gain was good in both of them, and the number of injections were also reduced. They were shortened the treatment only if there is persistent fluid or there is a loss of uh, visual acuity and few other criteria which I mentioned here. Note is that the minimum interval was still eight weeks and maximum interval was 16 weeks here. So once for the first time we have used, uh, the study has shown us that 16 week extension of the interval between two injections and what happens. So even at 16 week, in, uh, you can see that uh, both the arms, two week treat and extend as well as four week treat and extend, both of them had reasonable good uh, vision and almost 60% of the patients could achieve a 12 week interval between the injections and 40 to 46% of the patients could achieve a 16 week interval. So we are now at a stage where we can extend the period of interval between two injections to up to 16 weeks. And with this adjustment of 16 weeks, almost 96% of the patients could be kept at this in injection interval for the second year. So conclusions from the ALTER study was that intravitreal aflibercept injection was able to increase the treat and extend period to almost 16 weeks. This is a study which has recently been published in May 2022. So they did a sub-analysis of patients of ALTER study. Out of the 247 patients which were in included in this study, 90 patients were of PCV. And we all know that PCV can have a very aggressive course, but amazingly, if you see the results, they found that almost 90 to 91% of the patients who had PCV could also be extended and they could be uh, kept at a 16 week interval almost in 51. Half the patients of PCV enrolled in the Altair study were at 16 week treat and extend. The next study was the ARIES study, and here also they compared the early treat and extend with late treat and extend, but both of them were found to be equally good. Number of injections were more or less the same. After these randomized clinical trials, there were a lot of real world scenarios, like this study from Moorfields Hospital. They studied the treat and extend for three years, and for me, the most important thing was that 90% of the patients could be maintained. 27% of the patients did not need a repeat of injection in the year three. So if we do a proactive treatment, we can actually, in a position at some point of time, in some percentage of patients, to taper them off. 
not only for the patient but for the caregiver you can see that the number of visits are much lesser and so the productivity loss is also much lesser because of these uh, rcts and the real world uh, data a lot of meta analysis has been done which has included only rcts in observational studies and they found that this was extremely possible to have the TNE regimen which was more useful and led to better preservation of vision and reduce the number of injections. So this is another one. This is from multi-center study in Japan. Almost 50% of these patients, 97 enrolled, had PCV. So this study gives us a comparison between PCV patients and neovascular AMD patients. And you see here also similar has been seen that with treat and extend, number of patients of PCV who could be maintained at 12 week interval is actually 67%, which is more than 51%, which can be seen with neovascular AMD. And they also needed fewer injections over a two year period. So what we had initial concept that PCV will need PDT, it with aflibercept monotherapy also, and with treat and extend, we are able to achieve these results. Another very interesting study is to look at polyp regression. So we know as long as the polyps are active, you will have recurrences in PCV. So polyp regression was seen at the end of three months with intravitreal aflibercept in 50% of the eyes and in 40% of the patients who reached, uh, were able to be 16 week interval at the year of uh, two years. And the importance of poly regression, they say, was that the recurrences were much lesser, total number of injections were much lesser, and the mean treatment interval was significantly higher if you were able to achieve polyp regression. So with this RCT, with this real world data, consensus uh, and guidelines for treatment have emerged from Taiwan for new vascular AMD, and they have said that three monthly injections must be given. Treatment should after that be on a treat and extend. You can use a two weekly treat and extend or a four weekly treat and extend. 16 week interval is uh, permitted and was seen in most of the studies. And they have said that after two or three consecutive 16-week intervals, if the eye remains dry, you can consider exiting anti-invasive treatment. Similar consensus recommendations from Asia Pacific Vitro Retina uh, Society, they have said that three consecutive injections must be done for PCV eyes. After that, they go into a two or four weekly treat and extend regime. And then they have mentioned that if you are using ranibizumab, the recommendation is that the, the treat and extend should be capped at 12 weeks. But with aflibercept, they have allowed the treat and extend to be capped at 16 week interval because that is what has been found to be efficacious. So just leaving you with a couple of examples, this is a type one patient which I have been treating. Vision was 6-6 six, six, and over a period of time with single, with multiple and uh, intravitreal injections of aflibercept on a treat and extend regime, we have kept, the patient has been able to keep 6-6 six, six vision in the last four or five years. This is an example. You can see the left eye had a large scar. It's a single eyed patient. And when they, it is 81 year old, and we know increased age is a poor prognostic factor, this eye also had 6 6 vision. But after a monthly loading dose, patient has maintained 6 6. This is 2017. This is 2018. This is 2019. And you can see, though the patient had a little drop due to uh, the COVID, but we were able to bring her back, and she still maintains. 6-6 uh, six, six vision at the last follow-up in 2022. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Praveen. And that is a great summing up of all the data we have so far in our uh, ASNE. Before we go uh, further and discuss this topic, I think the problem that happens is that very often what is seen in clinical trials doesn't get translated into your cl uh, cl clinical uh, evidence when you actually treat the patients. So we have Dr. Chaitra, who's going to be discussing about what her experience, her actual experience with uh, aflibercept is, and uh, I look forward to hear. Thank you, sir. So my uh, previous experience has not actually been a treat and extend, because uh, given the cost of the drug, we never used to follow that regime, and it's really not very practical in our uh, country to ask patients to come on a regime. It's difficult, because there are many challenges, and we were discussing yesterday in another meeting, too, 
it's cost, it's the caregiver bringing them, and they don't really stick to schedule unless probably they're on a trial with us. That's the only time they get to come because we're paying for their transport, we're paying for their attender's transport, and we're paying for their drug, we're paying for their investigations. Otherwise, nobody ever comes on the time or the date that they're asked to come. So with these uh, couple of cases, I don't have too many where I have a very long interval, really a documented interval between the treatment, but since that was the subject, just put a, uh, together a couple of cases. So this is a 76-year-old gentleman, one-eyed. Uh, the other eye lost to a scarred uh, CNVM. He complained of metamorphopsia. The vision was 6-9 uh, at presentation. You can see SREM there, you can see SRF, and you can also see a taut uh, posterior hyalot. So this was in March uh, 2017. Uh, there was no clear evidence of uh, polyps. Uh, this patient, uh, uh, though they, we did see a leakage on FA, no polyps as such on the ICGA. So this patient underwent multiple uh, anti-VEGF injections. This was in March, May, Ju July. You can see, in spite of these several injections, the SREM increased, the PD increased, and then subsequently there was some resolution of the SREM, but then still the SRF remained and even the PD remained. So in September 2017, this was a presentation. We thought, you know, we're missing something. Probably we need a change of uh, diagnosis. We need to rethink. And then uh, we repeated the angiography. And even then, you see a well-defined neovascular net, but uh, you can't really see any polyps here. You know, you don't pick up any of those uh, lesions there. So this was in, again, uh, Jan uh, 2018 and uh, March 2018. You see persisting SRF with increasing PEDs here. So the patient kept coming back. We kept treating with uh, whatever anti-VEGF uh, option the patient took up at that point. And in November 2018 is when we decided that, you know, we'll go ahead with uh, Aflibacep for this patient. And uh, December 2018, you can see a very good resolution uh, with the response in the PD and the SRF as well as uh, decreased uh, quite well with the first injection itself. So after the first injection, we followed up this patient Jan 2019 and April 2019. So that's almost, uh, you know, four months. There was no recurrence at all, unless, unlike in the previous uh, times when, you know, the recurrence was very, very frequent. Here we were able to push it at least for about four months. There was, uh, but uh, unfortunately, a return of the PD and the SRF here again. So uh, this was in June 2019 is uh, when the uh, post uh, second aflibacept, again, you see complete resolution and we followed up this patient till March 2022. And there has been no, uh, you know, recurrence of, of the condition. The patient is very happy with the result and continues to follow up because uh, there's been almost a sustained response for uh, over two years now. So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, we saw excellent response in a non-responding patient, uh, and especially a one-night patient, you know, we want to give them the best advantage that there is. This is a 65-year-old lady, 6'9 uh, uh, vision. As you can see here, there are multiple polyps. You can also see a BVN. There's a large uh, PD with REM and notched PDs as well. So here the diagnosis was uh, quite clear. So straight away we went ahead with uh, aflibercept in 2019, Jan. And about uh, 20 to 25 days later, we also, uh, since there were some, uh, you know, extra macular polyps, we also went ahead and did uh, focal. We thought we'll get more, you know, sustained response if we combine it with a focal laser here. So the SREM resolved faster here than the PED. And uh, also the, uh, if you can see the images on the left are nasal to the disc. You can also see a PED there. That also started uh, flattening uh, sub subsequent to the aflibacept. So there was no recurrence of the polyps or the fluid or anything after three years. There was a good response in this patient with combined treatment for even the extramacular polyps uh, did resolve very well. So I think this was last in 2019. We've kept a close follow-up again. Every three to four months or any symptoms, we ask the patient to come back to us, has had sustained response. Now, uh, the third patient, a 70-year-old gentleman, left eye vision was 6-12. You can see here, again, a large PED with REM, and uh, this uh, case is an example of how, you know, one uh, treatment approach really does not work for every patient, whether it is an anti-VEGF or whether it's laser. So since this was a little similar to the previous patient, we thought, uh, you know, there are extramacular polyps, why don't we go ahead and also do a focal laser? Unfortunately, post-focal laser, there was increase in the fluid, the hyperreflective material also increased drastically after the uh, focal laser. Uh, so this, uh, we, uh, you know, restrained from doing any more laser. Of course, it was also very difficult there given the amount of, you know, subretinal material there. 
So we continued with aflibesep with this patient. We took time for uh, both the PD and the uh, hyperreflective material to resolve. And uh, we persisted. This was in March uh, 21, uh, July. Uh, we've been giving this patient uh, injections every two to three months. And the patient kind of maintains with that amount of uh, vision. And uh, since the posterior pole is quite clear, the vision is also very well maintained. So this was the last uh, follow-up. I think the last injection we gave was in Jan this year. And after Jan, we have not had to repeat injections for this patient. This is unfortunately for the right eye. So what I was showing you all along was the left eye. This patient came back in November for the right eye drop in vision. And since we had already had a bad experience with the left eye, we didn't take any risk. We gave one injection in November and the second one in Jan after which we have really not had the patient come in for a follow-up probably because of uh, you know, resolution or maintenance of the disease. So this is not like a treat and extend. It's like a patient opted uh, treat and extend because the patient's vision has been maintained. So bilateral PCV, left eye, subretinal and sub-RP bleed, a flibercept and focal laser, but then we didn't really do very well with the focal laser here. The right eye came with the PCV and SRF and did respond well to a flibercept. So this is my fourth case. This is a 58-year-old lady. Despite this very, uh, you know, scary-looking OCT, the vision is still 6-9 in her. So we again went ahead and we did the uh, angiographies to basically decide, you know, what we are uh, handling here and what to treat the patient with. So you can see here there is both fresh or absorb and absorbing uh, blood here. You can see both on the image here. So this is one month uh, post aflibercept. So, I mean, one would expect that it will take time to respond given that there's such, such a severe disease here. But if you can see in just one month, uh, there is extremely good response. The hyperreflective material has coming down. There's also, uh, you know, uh, an amazing improvement with the PED as well. So we tend to worry as to whether we should even treat these patients or not. But given the fact that the patient had extremely good vision, and we don't want it to worsen. I think we did well in giving uh, this patient any treatment, uh, and it did well. So after the second aflibercept, again, you can see resolution. And uh, this sustained for almost uh, 18 months just after the second injection. This is our last follow-up of that patient. So uh, what uh, we've seen in our series, what I've observed is that uh, those patients with uh, PCV and massive subretinal and sub-RP bleeds, vascular PDs, a flibercept or in combination does work uh, very well. Again, uh, with a lot of SHREM, we've seen good response. We always thought that, uh, you know, SHREM is a bad prognostic indicator, but I think these couple of cases shows that uh, actually SHREM can also go away with uh, good outcomes. We saw sustained response in most of these cases, which is two to three doses of uh, flibercept and a treatment-free uh, period for more than a year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh Chetra, basically, um, most of your patients have been on CRN treatment. Yes. And actually, you have torn to shreds the concept of a treat and extend. <laughs> because <laughs> the, actually, uh, I was going to ask something else, but now my first question is should we start off with PRN or should we start off with treat and extend when we uh, start treatment? Um, Praveen? Because since there are a large number of patients who may end up with a huge, um, you know, um, a huge time gap before they get a return. The question is, is it, you know, in her first patient, the patient if got two injections, and in the same period, if we had put treat and extend, she would probably have got 10 injections. Now, is it worth subjecting, and especially in a country like ours, is it worth subjecting patients to 10 injections or I'll give you the alternative. Put the patient on PRN and see the time it takes for the patient to get recurrences. And you can do that over the next uh, two, three injections, and you have a fair idea of how much time is occurring. And then if the patient is requiring injections more frequently, you start with the treat and extend. And if it's already a huge gap, you maintain the gap which you're getting. So that means you cut short the period to a treat and extend. So I think uh, I understand your question, and uh, I would probably put it as, I don't like to use the PRN. I would say you, we use a combination of treat and observe and treat and extend. So if you really feel that, you know, sometimes a very tiny CNV, you've given three loading dose, or sometimes you may even see two loading dose and the patient is doing well, 
especially if it's a small early type 2 lesion, which is where your biomarkers also come into play, your clinical judgment comes into play. You think that now I have that much body of experience, you know which one will go which way. If you want to first give, treat and observe, you do one step of treat and observe, see the patient again. But then straight away don't call four weeks or straight away don't call 16 weeks later. No, we call, call four, four weeks. weeks later. No, no, I'm sorry. I, the exactly. follow-up in all these cases would be four weekly. Yes. So if the we are going to... The treatment would be given PRN as required. Yeah. So and you can reduce the number of, of injections. Months, you have an idea. How much? Yeah. If you reduce the number of injections, you have to compromise that you have to increase the number of visits. Yeah, I think one you know one problem that's happening with concepts of uh, PRN is to increase the interval. Interval increase comes after six weeks of uh, six months of no treatment. It does not come in the beginning, so that's the important thing. Yes. So if you are doing treat and observe, then you can have to. The next visit has to be four weeks. Then it can't be twelve weeks. Yes. So follow ups four weeks, treatment as required, determine the kind of interval you are requiring. And start short of that, yes, uh, Raja? Mike is right behind you. Can we get a mic for him? Can we have a roving mic rather than... So even what you are saying about increasing the interval after six months, it's probably six months of inactivity. A person yes. has been receiving injections multiple in the first six It doesn't months. work. Yeah, it, you still have to call them every it month. It comes monthly. Only if you have six months of inactivity, then you can increase the intervals four to six, six to eight, eight to ten, yes. up to twelve weekly. But twelve weekly intervals never go away. Yeah, but the, the, the biggest point which you have made, everyone should understand, and that's the major problem in giving out this concept of treat and extend PRN, is that in PRN you have to come every four weeks. Yes. yes. And that has to be understood by everyone. And that is not a free visit. Yes. It has indirect cost. Yes. And that is why you are looking at treat and extend. And now, I think Dr. Talwar has told very clearly many years ago, if the injection is being provided free by insurance system, then the cost of the visit is much more than the cost of the treatment. Yes. Whereas if it's a cash pay patient out of pocket, the cost of treatment is much more than the cost of the visit. So you have to judge that and take into account which one is going to be more cost effective. But the overall point is PRN means the patient has to come every four weeks. Follow up is four weeks. Yes. Actually, she's made the point very clearly. You see, two injections versus maybe 12 in the same period with the same results. So, and the number of patients who will be getting these extra injections in CNV is something like 30 to 40 percent of patients. So, that's a huge number. Yeah. So, so if you, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dinesh, Praveen, and everybody, the panel, I would like to ask, do you feel that the response is different in patients who have primarily a subretinal pathology like in PCV? with or without hemorrhage and shrimp, or those which have intraretinal edema? And would you differentiate these patients in the loading do dose concept? Yeah, uh, okay. I think so I will know, definitely look at what pathology I'm doing and then only decide on treat and observe or treat and extend. But the, 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 as Dr. Raja mentioned, if the patient is outstation patient also and he has to come so far, then treat and extend works best for him. In our scenario, yeah. when patients are traveling for so far, they said, okay, now we have come, at least give us injection. Next time we will come six weeks later. So yeah. it works. They also understand. We also understand. Unless but the patient is traveling yeah. to uh, Chennai from Ladakh, yes. the cost of treatment is higher than the cost no, of No, but the they take leave. They come off. They, various yeah. things are there. So, so but basically, uh, one more point I'd like to raise. You know, there is a tendency to say all CNVs are the same. The fact is it's not so. Type 2 CNVs will respond very well even to uh, ranibizumab. They have an excellent response to any anti-VEGF. Most of them will respond within three, CN, uh, three injections. So to, to club them together doesn't make sense. And I would actually uh, you know, um, sort of want 
a Raja to maybe do a VRSI survey and check, is there an actual difference in their response? Then why should we club them together? We should actually create paradigms, algorithms, which are separate for, uh, for uh, classic and occult. So there have been numerous studies which have shown not only classic and occult, type one behaves differently, type two behaves differently, type three behaves differently. So this is where you use your clinical judgment the, the, and your biomarkers. The point is the studies don't do that. Why don't is, the studies do that? So there is a sub-analysis now coming. So they have done type three analysis separately and they have said that these do respond to lesser number of injections. So, what, so what all Dr. this is happening. Salwar is asking is that we are talking about AR, ARMD here right yes. now for treat and extend, not for myopic CNA. Not myopic CNA. Not myopic type 2 CNA. Because ARMD ARM typically ARM come either yes. minimally type classic one, type or occult with three. no classic. Very few are predominantly classic. So that's what type 2, type 1 uses just for that class. There is a small so segment of ARMD also which, which has type absolutely. 2. Yes. Yes. Sorry, uh, just to kind of, you know, take the discussion back to, unfortunately, this is me and uh, you'll all have to bear with me for one second. The evidence base that Praveen, Dr. Praveen Sen showed was actually grade A evidence. And I think she's very nicely demonstrated that I think this is the way we need to treat our patients. We can all deviate because of circumstances, economics, region, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the gold standard of treatment today, whether it's Morpheus, whether it's Baskin Palmer, whether it is any of the big centers in the world, whether it's Shankara, whether it's my practice, I'm not a leading center of the world is treat and extend. We will always have one case, I can show you one case which is done very well with one injection, that does not become the evidence base. So Absolutely. everyone who's sitting here, unfortunately, Chaitra followed kind of with Dr. Sen. I don't want people to get confused. I think all of us sitting here will totally agree that if I had AMD today, I would not kind of want a one-off injection and then, you know, we'd all go with the treat and extend approach because I think the risk of recurrence, as Dr. Sen very correctly showed, if you look at the Orte study, a lot of people who went to 16 had to be brought back to 8 as well. That means that there was a recurrence. So if you're thinking that one patient is going to be out to 16 weeks and stay there for the rest of the life, about 40% of patients who went to Q16 had to be brought back because Absolutely. once they went to Q16, if they had a recurrence, they came back to Q8 and stayed at Q8. Yes. That shows that there's disease activity in these eyes. These are not benign eyes. If a PCV bleeds while you're extending, monitoring, PRNing, whatever you're doing, you could knock that patient from 6, 12 to counting fingers very quickly. Bailey has showed very nicely that at least in PCV, one-eyed patients, a constant injection reduces the risk of a bleed and loss of vision. So I think, you know, in a one-eyed patient, I think a treat and extend or something more rigorous is definitely very advantageous. And in a city like Bombay, Chennai, Talwar Sahib, yourself, if somebody, a son has to take leave to come and bring the parent to the hospital, there is half a day, there's a huge cost to it. I think treat and extend, the advantages are really big. So I think Chetra, one case will do great, but I think evidence base today is yet treat and extend. I agree for, yeah. and thank you for putting it talk together yeah. very well. Nishan, uh, I think you will have to come back. So <laughs> <laughs> there is one protocol we never discussed. We, uh, I mean, it's uh, not even touched, but it was part of the view to study second year, CAP PRN. So when you are talking about treat and extend, you are still push not getting the patient into your clinic every four weeks. That's a very, very important thing. So even if we are talking about treat and extend where the patient is not being called back every four weeks, why can't you use a cap PRN if you are so worried about, you know, getting a patient having bleeding earlier, right? It's so still a proactive mm -hmm. regimen. It's not a reactive regimen. Most of these studies have used capped PRN. Okay, actually. I, I Initially think we will, we will not discuss this point PRN. because this point, you know, uh, this will, we are just repeating the same things again and again. Let's sir, come to, yeah. Sir, I have just one question for the panel. Sir, I think we all agree now with treat and observe and gradually increasing and decreasing the duration. Now, once we have reached 16 weeks, sir, what is the end point? Yeah, I'm when coming to that. When would we like to stop the treatment? Thanks, because, Bhuvan. The, yeah. You... This is exactly the point. So this is one of the consensus which I had shown also, the consensus and guidelines which have been put up by the Asia Pacific Society. So they have said that 16 weeks interval, then two or three injections at 16 weeks, and then you try to withdraw and see whether any recurrence happens or not. Okay, this is so one. The other one is the futile lesion. How do you label something as a futile lesion? That now you have kept the patient on no, treat and extend for a long time. Better. Lesion is very Smaller. big visual equity is not improving, withdraw the treatment. And if there is no further drop in vision, that means the antivagive is not really doing any further benefit and the patient may not visually improve. So, so then again, you stop. But if there is drop, 
then you have to restart. So these so two things have come recently. We are talking about stopping the treatment at 16 weeks after giving two injections yes. if there is no fur, if uh, that is the guideline. That, yes. And then seeing, and then just doing the patient's follow-up. So follow we keep up. the follow-up Now, up please every keep month? it, no, but no, before no. you come, just keep it in mind, the Altair study is a very aggressive treatment study. I just want you to realize this because it shortens the intervals even for persistent CNVM. If there is persistent fluid, the interval is shortened. The interval is increased only in the presence of a dry retina, which means when you say 16-week interval was reached, it means it was a dry retina. When you give your second 16-week interval injection, it means now the, treat the patient has been dry for eight months. So keep that in mind. This would not hold for patients who are stable and not yet dry, because they would not, according to Altair, ever reach 16 weeks. But they would not be allowed to extend. Is there any role of increasing the duration further from 16 weeks to 20 weeks and then stop? No. It? So that's exactly the point. You that if you're 16 weeks, you've got a dry lesion, and twice you've got that dry lesion, you've got eight months of a inter without any uh, in, uh, problem. So that is where you can follow up. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Talwar sir often, often mentions no, that no these no patients, no. you need to actually tell them that either you die or I die, and that's how it goes. Yes. Because I've had, I've burnt my fingers with these exit strategies where I have gone beyond 16 weeks and then I've stopped and these patients have actually lost vision, come down to finger counting. Yeah, so the follow-up doesn't stop. Absolutely. So See, the, the, the treatment is stopping, the follow-up is not stopping. So that is the difference. And uh, even after, like, you know, going for a 16-week uh, injection interval, the patient has to come actually earlier. If you really want to do justice to that patient, it shouldn't be 16-weekly you know, interval of yes. checking up. Now, the other important thing I'd like to raise, how many patients? We are talking of only 40% of patients. This is only 40% of patients who reached 16 weeks. There are 60% patients who still need management. What are we doing for them? We need to find alternative drugs and therapies. <laughs> we need to find alternative treatment modalities. What? This is not perfect, so research has to continue. Like you have long-term duration, I think we have the injectable, the port device, various things. So this is not the best the treatment, ideal treatment, but this is what yeah. we have as of now. See, the reason I'm asking this is the Altair study did not allow an extension if the patient had persistent fluid, not increasing fluid, but persistent fluid. Would we consider, I'm asking the panel, would we consider extending the duration in patients who got stable fluid, not persistent fluid, but persistent fluid, but absolutely stable, no change in OCT, no change in vision? Would you try to extend the, uh, in these patients? Actually, the criteria of retreatment or shortening treatment is increased in CRT of more than 100 micro. It is not an absolute any increase. A drop of letter of more than five Increase of more than 100, 100 is what has been so used in Altair. for shortening. I am talking of yeah. increasing. No, I am saying you've got a patient who's not changing the fluid. The fluid level is staying constant. You're at eight weeks today. You've given three injections, no change in the fluid, no change in the vision. Would you consider changing to 10 weeks now and seeing can we maintain the same thing on 10 weeks? So and I think maybe we can maintain them this this stability at 12 weeks. So this is the setup that we see in the clinical thing also. We are not always measuring the CRT and then taking a call. We look at the visual acuity, patient is stable, and we then exactly. take a call and extend. So it's so sometimes you cannot measure 100 micron and then follow Altair, that Altair told me this, so I'm not going to do that. But clinical judgment is always, Boy, you, you know. Like so I think in that, I think in that context, instead of a four-weekly extension, you'd go, go to a two-weekly extension yes, yes. because you would want to be a yes. little more kind of circum circumspect. Absolutely. And uh, because the four-weekly then would, I think, be jumping the gun. Yeah, so the basic point is, you see, even eyes which have stable fluid, the Altair study gave you a situation where it was very, very aggressive in its treatment. But I think we should consider in these patients who have stable fluid, stable vision, you increase the duration by two weeks. And if there is no change, 
you can continue for two weeks, then increase by another two weeks till you determine the level at which the patient is actually getting the recurrence or an increase. You may be able to extend many of these patients too to maybe 10 weeks, maybe not to 12 weeks, maybe not to 16 weeks. So I'll just yeah, like to add, I think uh, we should increase by two weeks if it is stable, but it also, you have to be careful about the type of the fluid. I think a subretinal fluid is the one which would be more acceptable. Yeah. And there are also some studies which say it is probably protective also, and the vision is also better. But pro if there is an intraretinal fluid, I think you have to be more careful. But it doesn't go away. Yeah, you if have it's to, not you have going to, away, that's the point. So you have to either treat it again or whatever, change the drug or I think the intraretinal fluid is, should yeah, not be tolerated. Okay, if you want to change the drug, yeah, that's the it next It should choice. not be tolerated. My point is, uh, we should be careful about the intraretinal fluid. Okay. So this is the case where I think OCT-based, thickness-based treatment decision making, we moved away from it first time in CAT trial. You don't look at just the thickness, VTDR is great. Any fluid you treat, and what Bowen pointed out, if at all we want to look at a stable fluid, there is a case based on evidence that you may want to differentiate whether it's intraretinal or subretinal fluid, but you, if it is subretinal fluid, you are still allowed an extension like as if there were no right. fluid. Let's say but if there is an intraretinal fluid, there's no way you can extend so it. So Hawken allowed you, the Altair did not. Yeah, so I would, probably at this time go by the evidence that any intraretinal fluid is cannot be tolerated. Uh, this patient will be at risk yeah, of vision reason, loss. But the reason I'm mentioning is because there are patients who have intraretinal fluid which becomes stable. So when you reach that level, there is no harm considering that whether this is staying stable at a little higher interval. Yeah, it you may don't be, lose anything. But if it's a two week interval that you increase, you don't lose anything. Yeah, okay, okay. I. Uh, one last thing which is important, Altair used two-week extensions and four-week extensions. Would, what would, Praveen, what would you advocate? So again, case to base, based, you start with a two-week extension, and then if very quickly, you can move on to a four-week thing as well. So which is the recommendation also, that either two-week or four-week, depending upon your clinical judgment, how stable the patient is. The thing is, the reason why I ask this question is because the results of four weekly extension are not as good. Yeah. And the, you see, if you see, there are two aspects. One is reaching 16 weeks. The second is maintaining 16 weeks. If you do two weekly extension, the patients who reach 16 weeks maintain that extension. extension. If you go, if you do four weekly extension, they reach it once and they regress. You know, the figures are something like 54% reaching it comes down to uh, almost 40% uh, uh, are the ones who maintain it. Ultimate maintenance is the same 40% in both the groups. So it's better probably, I would suggest moving at two weekly extensions, a little slower, like a tortoise, and coming to the right point, you'll come to the right, same point, but probably without any regressions. So that's one important thing. Uh, any comments? I, I agree, I do two weekly. Yeah, okay. Sure. And uh, Dr. Dogra has told us to get out, so. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we will stop over here, and the rest of the points can be raised. We won't extend it anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
Sachin. I think we had a very heated discussion uh, in the first half, and I hope uh, second half will be much cooler because uh, primarily we have a uh, discussion on diabetes, which is not so so demanding as compared to RMD. And uh, I was talking to Mangat. You see, it's always better to go slow. We always write follow-up for say two weeks, oblique SOS. And I still believe patient home monitoring vision metamorphopsia can, and it will not make. And whatever bleed, uh, you know, occasionally with injection also it can happen. Or without injection, the incidence is not too much of difference. Here, in any case, uh, compared to AMD, DM is uh, more forgiving than AMD. AMD uh, is uh, uh, more VEGF load there. So we'll begin with uh, our star speaker, uh, Nishant, and uh, one of the most uh, lucid, uh, you know, messages he gives. And uh, his uh, talk will be primarily on can early and intensive treatment reduce the burden? Thank you so much. It's a wonderful pleasure being here. First of all, welcome to all of you to Mumbai who are not from here. It's wonderful to have you here. And we're very proud to have the Geo Center here, which I think is one of the world's best uh, convention centers I think there is. This is a topic where I'm very scared because I know that Dr. Verma has some views on it, etc. So it'll be great debate, but let me put the evidence to you and then you can decide. So financial disclosures, I do get research and travel grants from almost everybody who exists. There's no doubt today that the gold standard for treatment in DME is an anti-VEGF. No matter which study you look at, no matter which drug you look at, for the first time we're seeing a significant number of people improving in vision, and that's kind of, you know, two lines on Snellen or more, and more than 90 to 95% of people stabilizing the vision. So I think today anti-VEGF treatment for DME is the kind of known thing. Let's look at some of the lessons we learned from the earlier DME trials. Well, the Rise and Ride was a monthly ranibizumab trial, and what you learned with, the, with intensive treatment given almost for a year, you can see that the vision improves and stays improved. So that was the first time that we actually saw vision improvement at this degree. But the other thing I want you to see is that actually the vision improves after the first injection, but it does continue to improve. That graph kind of has an upward trend for a few more injections after that as well. The second thing we noticed is that if people who did not get the injection in the first two years were then swapped over, their improvement is not so good. So we always think of DME as being a forgiving disease, but it isn't that forgiving because the visual results, if you don't treat early, do tend to suffer. And the third thing we see is that if you've treated these people kind of quite aggressively and then move on to an open label extension, when I say open label, that basically means that people are coming in and going so that the follow-up is a bit poorer because it's not a clinical trial, as Chaitra very nicely said, that when you're paying for their transport, et cetera, your compliance is better. But if you treated them aggressively over a period of two years beyond the kind of open treatment, you notice that the vision remains maintained. So you do get some benefits of early treatment you know, even later on in the course of disease, up to five years, right? So that was kind of something that was interesting. The other thing is that, oh my God, if you're giving monthly treatment, or if you're treating so aggressively, you're gonna to treat too much and the number of treatments is gonna be crazy. The DRCR network study showed us that the average number of treatments, even with intensive early treatment, was about eight to nine. That half, so less than half to about three to two in the second year, and even kind of reduces further in third year. And the same thing we saw in Restore, where the early treatment is about eight injections in the first year. It halves in the second year and then further halves in the third year. So the number of injections goes down, though you're treating quite aggressively in the first year. In the open extension of the ride and rise, what you notice that actually 25% of people did not need any treatment at all. That means if you hit it hard initially and get that edema down, you're gonna get the benefits much later on. And the average number of injections over a period of time was less than three a year, which is quite manageable. Then of course can aflibicep, now you all know about this drug, it's, it's like preaching to the choir, but it does act against all VEGF A, all VEGF B, and placental growth factor, which is an advantage it has over the other drugs. And of course, most of us out here will know that the kind of, the potency of the drug against the receptor is almost 70 times greater than ranibizumab, which is the other licensed drug for DME, and about 100 times more than bevacizumab, which is the off-licensed drug. So in theory, this is a much more potent drug. Let's look at the clinical trial data. At this stage, you'd expect me to talk about protocol T, but I'm gonna save that for later. Let's look at the initial study with Vivid and Vista, which were the first trials done for DME with aflibercept. What you notice is that this was laser versus aflibercept versus two dosing regimes of aflibercept. So 2Q4, which means every four weeks, or 2Q8. 
The thing to remember is that all eyes actually got five monthly injections to start off with. So that's an important thing I want you to remember. And after two years, the laser arm could be swapped around. So let's look at this result. It's a crowded graph, but I'll try and put some boxes up. So first thing you notice is that the vision is fantastic. You get two snell and lines or more than 10 letters of improvement, which we'd never seen before. Now, as I told you, everybody gets five loading injections. And if you look at that dotted line, what that's showing you is the graph that after five dotted lines, most people have completed their ascent, and then they're plateauing out. So if you gave only one or two injections, there'd be part of that ascent that you would have missed out. So five monthly injections, what it does is it gets you to that plateau level where the vision is going to be very, very good. And then after that, whether you go 2Q4 or 2Q8, even if you extend the interval by double and make it every two months, you notice the vision doesn't change. So that early intensive treatment gives you the maximum benefit you're going to get. And then even if you can reduce the burden of treatment, you maintain that vision because it's the first five injections that get you that maximum benefit. You're squeezing the eye out for the maximum benefit. And of course, and this study showed us that if you wait for two years in the laser arm and then swap, the vision is really bad. So though it's a forgiving disease, it's not that forgiving. If you look at protocol T, all of you know about this study. It looked at ranibizumab versus bevacizumab versus aflibercept. Just remember that you know the ranibizumab used was 0.3. That's because that's what is licensed in the US. Nowhere in the world was 0.3 available. And the rise and right shows us that 0.3 and 0.5 were just as good. Now, this was a PRN regime, but the thing is that it was a strictly controlled PRN regime. That means that you had to kind of continue to get injected if you were kind of showing any signs of improvement or worsening. So obviously, it makes sense. If you're getting better, please continue injections. If you're getting worse, stop. If there's no improvement or worsening, but you'd achieve normal vision, which is 6-6 vision, that means you squeeze the eye out and you're back to normal, the treatment could be deferred. What happens if the vision did not become 6-6? Well, then if it was below the six-month visit, you needed to continue to get the monthly injection. That means that if you hadn't achieved 6-6 till week 24, you would get an injection mandated because there was yet that hope that you could squeeze a little bit of extra vision out of that eye. So effectively what this meant is that most people got about five injections and then they moved on, right? So this is the label in Europe. It's five monthly dosing and then Q8. We can argue about whether this is a dosing regime suitable for India or not, but this is the clinical trial data that I'm showing you. We all know this graph, so I'm not going to waste too much time, but aflibercept does tend to do better at two years as well. And if you look at that graph of ascent, it rises more rapidly. That means the patient sees a more rapid improvement of vision, and it goes higher. That means you're getting a better quantum of improvement as well. If you looked at people with 612 vision or worse, in the first year, we all know it was statistically significant. In the second year, that statistical significance was not there, but yet a flipper was giving you a better value for money or better bang for buck. But you need to look at area under the curve. If you look at area under the curve, which is a much more scientific way of looking at this data because it tells you what is the overall journey of the patient over two years rather than what happened at one point of time, because that point of time is data tied forward. There are lots of statistical ways to make up for missing data. This tells you on average what happened, and obviously in this case, a flibercept gives you almost one snell in line better than the other two available drugs. Number of injections, as we've seen, though you're giving very intensive treatment in the first year, average number of injections about nine, in the second year, it drops down to half of that, about four to five. So over two years, you're looking at about 14 injections to get really good visual results. Now let's look at some really kind of new data about early intensive treatment. If you look at this graph, if you'd given three injections in protocol T, you would yet notice that about 50% of people, even in the ILEA group, would have had persistent macular edema. But if you gave five injections, then that number of people who had persistent macular edema drops down to 31%. That means from 50%, you get another 20% of people who will not have any persistent macular edema by giving two more injections, which I think is worth fighting for. If you look at the proportion of people who continue to improve, because I told you the Vivid and Vista trials told us that, listen, you have to give five monthly doses. So let's see, after at zero, that means at zero, you got injection one. As you'd expect, about 59% of people got an improvement of five letters or more. After the second injection, that goes up. After the third injection, 16% of people got an additional five letters. Now, if you had stopped there, what would have happened is that this proportion of people, which is 14% after the fourth injection, and another 14% after the fifth injection, you would not have given them the benefit of one Snell in line. One Snell in line is very, very important in people who have a chronic condition and anything can happen. So in this case, if you stopped at three injections and did not continue with the early intensive treatment, 
30% of people would have not got that benefit of an additional five letters, which is really, really important. If you look at this from another perspective, we want the OCT to be better. As Raja was telling us that, you know, we don't look at kind of CFT, we look at fluid today, and I completely agree with him. But after the third injection, so you gave the third injection, 20% of people got an improvement in CFT. After the fourth injection, another 16% got an improvement in CFT of about 10%. And after the fifth injection, another 12%. So if you'd stopped at that kind of third injection, not continued with your early intensive treatment, 28% of people would not have had that benefit of the OCT and the fluid going down. Let me look at this another way. If you look at people, what happens is a lot of times we see this. You give it two injections, the vision has gone down. Most of the time that people start then saying, swap the drug, let's give an injection, let's do an OCT, let's see if there's some traction, maybe surgery. But in the studies, that wasn't allowed. So if you just continue giving monthly injections, this group of patients also does really, really well. They turn a corner and they do very well. So at one year, 8.8 letter improvement. At a three years, 11 letter improvement, just by continuing to give the anti-VEGF intensively and aggressively. Let's look at some data which comes kind of, you know, from protocol T. If you look at this line of three injections, you'll obviously see that there's that dark blue line. They've kind of almost reached their peak with three injections. But there's that light blue line which is improved but hasn't yet peaked. It hasn't got all its benefit yet. And that red line, they've actually done worse. Now again, of this course, no swapping of drug allowed, continue. If you gave five injections, the group in the blue line would continue. So maybe you'd say, Dr. Kumar, didn't you overtreat this group? But the light blue group continued to gain about three letters. And look at that red group, which you said was a goner, it's a non-responder, will not do anything. They've improved by about four letters. And over time, with that early intensive treatment, they maintain that visual improvement. Now, you don't know which group that patient is going to come into. So effectively, if you look at it, there are three groups. After three injections, they achieve their maximum response. That's your A-plus student. That's great. The group two is the one who starts improving but needs a little bit more treatment, a little bit more aggressive early treatment to get their full visual potential. And there's a third group. After th three injections, they've actually done really badly. But with two more injections, just a little bit more perseverance, they swap the corner and they do so well. So there is a subset of people who we traditionally thought were not doing well, but with early intensive treatment, they're going to do really, really well in the long term. And therefore, I think it's important to understand that unless you get 6-6 six, six vision and a normal fovea, early intensive treatment is recommended. I'm not going to step on Darius' shoes because I think this is his next talk. But because this comes from Morefields and I was an alma mater there, I was a consultant there, this comes from Phil Hyken's group, effectively they follow five monthly injections and Q8 and look at the vision improvement, 13.8 letters. I'm going to let kind of, you know, uh, Darius wow you with this study, but effectively what it tells you that the number of treatment with time, despite giving such intensive treatment in the first year, goes down dramatically. From 7.6 in the first year, out of which five were mandated, that means only two extra, in the second year, it goes down to 2.7. In the third year, about 2.9. So early intensive treatment gives you dividends later on. So what does the evidence suggest? Early intensive treatment produces the best results long term. Up to 30% of eyes with DME, even after the third, third injection, if you give them a fourth and fifth injection, they will get a one Snellen line improvement, which is worth fighting for. You will get kind of then, once you've kind of done the early intensive treatment, you can go to 2Q4, 2Q8, a treat and extend, and you really don't lose that early benefit that you've got. Loading dose. This is a very loaded term. I think, you know, it causes a lot of confusion, causes a lot of debate, causes lots of angst, and I think it causes a lot of divide. It's misused, misunderstood, and misquoted. So I think if we stick to early intensive treatment, maybe that's better. Treat till the vision becomes six six or the OCT is normal because that can be achieved in DME. Or if you feel the vision is not improving to six six, look back and say, is there some convincing structural evidence to suggest why it will not become? Is there ischemia? Is there some structural changes? If that is the case, then after two consecutive injections, the vision hasn't improved, you can say that, listen, maybe we can step off the gas now. But I think you have to be aggressive. There's no fixed dosing that's going to be applicable to every eye, as all the studies have shown us. Some eyes will get a great result and peak after three injections. Some of them are going to need more than three injections to get their best result. And some of them are going to do badly after three injections, but with two more injections, they're going to turn the corner. So I think the intention is to treat aggressively every four to five weeks till there is yet some scope for improvement. Try and squeeze the eye out. Try and squeeze that fovea out for the maximum vision because early intensive treatment is going to give you that bang for buck. 
ideally aim for 6.6 and a dry fovea because in DME that is possible. And sometimes we notice with CNVs that's not an option available to us. The number of injections, even if you're super aggressive in the first year, all the trials, all the evidence suggests the number of injections goes down with time in the second, third, fourth, and fifth years. I've heard people kind of saying, I get second references, I'm sure all of you do, that some doctor told me three injections are going to be enough. I think this is the biggest myth, and I hope it's a myth or it's the biggest deception. So either people are fooling their patients or fooling themselves, or they genuinely don't know. Because I have not found one study that has actually told us that three injections do anything for DME long term. Even when vision was 6-6 in one of the clinical trials, which said good vision, let's treat with an anti-VEGF, the mean number of injections was over two years was eight. So even when you have 6-6 vision, if you start on the journey of anti-VEGF, it's a long journey which requires treatment. Just to leave you with the thought that I run a charitable foundation called IBTs because diabetes blinds. We've got three Guinness World Records. Since you're in Mumbai, I thought I'd show you some slides of our celebrities who support diabetes and blindness, but we've run out of town. So I'm going to skip that and thank you very, very much. I think we'll have a discussion at the end also uh, after Dries. Uh, uh, where is Dries? Yeah. Uh, yeah. about uh, real world experience. Because to me, honestly, real world experience is more important than whatever trial uh, tries to push. So that's a tough act to follow, Dr. Nishant. So I'll just speak a little bit about the real world evidence. So like uh, Dr. Lali just said, the clinical trials are based on these strictly defined protocols. And they have a lot of exclusion criteria which may, we may not see in our patients, like patients with poor glycemic control, active PDR, etc. So in the real world, these patients are what actually come to us. So the protocol which strictly determines time frame for follow-ups, all this may not be so relevant for our setting. So although we are going to translate the clinical trials to our kind of clinics, let's look at the efficacy of the intravitreal aflibercep for treatment of center involving DME in a real world setting. So we just heard from Dr. Nishan the key messages from the clinical trial. Aflibercep is indeed the choice of treatment for patients' vision acuity worse than 69 ETR letters. That's less than 20 by 40 due to DME. And this has been shown by protocol T, and there's no doubt about it. The molecule has been designed to trap VEGF and PGF, which occur at very, very high levels in these disease and have a pathology and are important for DME. So this is the reason why. There's also a disease-modifying rule which is important when we use this molecule. And as we just learned in great detail, intensive treatment in year one can modify the underlying disease and improve the long-term visual outcome. So now along with this trial, let's see what is the real world evidence which is emerging, which will kind of support this and help us in our clinical practice. So I think the company also is supporting multiple real world studies. And these, as you can see from this uh, slide, they are across the world. There's none from India, so when I pointed out to uh, Dr. Prachi and team, they said, they, I mean, they would consider it, but there's no, none of these right now currently in India. So there's good uh, evidence from one of these trials which was held in France, and this showed that treatment naive patients who received the five initial doses of aflibercept gain numerically higher vision gains than those who don't. So this is what always we were taught about the pathology, that initially you have to give five injections, and this is supported by the real-world evidence. I think Dr. Nishan just spoke about this. This was at the Morfield's Eye Hospital. And again, even these authors say the purpose of the clinical trials is that there are various reasons. Patients uh, may have multiple doctor's appointments. They are the working, the diabetics, unlike the AMD patients, are the working age group population. So they don't comply strictly. 
and they did this trial because the strict regimen is not possible to replicate in the real world. So they wanted to kind of find a way to pragmatically deliver effective therapy, which was practical for their patients. So even this trial showed that aflibercep was associated with meaningful vision acuity gain and avoided loss of vision in the real world condition. And what they found also, which is interesting, that patients who presented with poor baseline visual acuity did very are constituting the majority of patients who come to our clinic. So they kind of echoed what protocol T showed, but that also in a clinical setting and not in a clinical trial. The visual gain also was excellent in all the groups. And this is what Dr. Nishant also showed the wow factor. In the first year, 7.6 injections were the mean number. But just look at the data after that. 12 to 24 months, only 2.7. And 24 to 36 months, only 2.9 injections were needed. So hit it hard initially and you'll reap the benefits later in year two and year three. I think that was a kind of pivotal message from this trial. There's also an interesting FRB, the Fight Retinal Blindness Registry, which is there in Australia. And they also uh, kind of compiled this uh, uh, data of patients who had less than 68, so that would roughly be 20 by 40. And they also they compared the two molecules, uh, ranibizumab and aflibercept, and they found significantly greater vision gains in aflibercept. You can see this is a plus 7.6, whereas this was plus 10.6 letters. So now we come to an RCT. So this is, of course, the highest level of evidence. So th this was a RT RCT published in the Cochrane uh, database uh, review. And this included a large number of patients. There was more than 6,000 patients, 24 studies. And they found that at year one, all efficacy outcomes favored aflibercept over the, uh, the molecules. Patients were uh, approximately 30% more likely to gain more than three lines with aflibercept compared to other, other molecules. And for every 1,000 patients with aflibercept, 92 fewer would gain three or more letters. So this would be roughly 10%. So even a 10% uh, patients doing better than other molecules is a significant number. So again, this is another slide based on the Cochrane metadata uh, uh, the database. So they said they were more effective. Of course, first they compared these to laser. So all the, uh, all the anti-VEGF agents are more effective than laser at improving vision. This is not, no rocket science. I think we all know that. Patients using aflibercept are more likely to gain more than three uh, BCVA at one year compared to the other molecules. And uh, I think at one year, patients receiving either ranibizumab or bevacizumab had lesser change in vision and lesser law, uh, CRT change compared to aflibercept. So here you can see that uh, ranibizumab versus bevacizumab seems almost same, whereas aflibercept is superior to both these other molecules. So the uh, certainty that they are more effective than laser, that is high, whereas the fact that ranibizumab and bevacizumab did not deter differ is moderate. What do the various retina societies across the world say? So these are some guidelines from Uretina. Then there are some guidelines from Australia published in Clinical Experimental Ophthalmology, guidelines from Canada, and guidelines from the German society. So Uretina guidelines provide expert opinion regarding this. And they have said the use of ranibizumab was most likely to result in the same activity after two years as aflibercept. So this is similar to protocol T but the effect will be reached in a slower manner. So therefore, treated, they, they recommend it should be started with aflibercept if it is available for these patients. So again, similar message that if it's worse visionized, we should start with aflibercept. This is some data by uh, Dr. Jamie Chung's group, and this is Asian data. And this is based on evidence based collected from Asian country. So the message is quite clear. The choice of the anti-VEGF should depend on the baseline visual equity. And again, similar to what they said with protocol T. And the key message, I think, which Dr. Nishant and I have we again and I'm trying to say that early intensive anti-VEGF is important for patients in Asia as it is across the world. 
The ASRS PAT survey is annually done by the American Society of Retina Specialists, and they had participants from 42 retina societies across the planet participating in it. And even they found that aflibercept is considered a treatment of choice for even new onset DME if the cost was not an issue. We all look up at the DRCR net because this is not a strict clinical trial. Some way they, are, they also recruit from private practices across America. And it is the fact that aflibercept is recognized as standard of care for DME is the, uh, the fact that DRCR net also recognizes it and it is using it in its, its, all its pivotal trials which are coming up now. So to summarize, aflibercept is treatment of choice for patients with visual less than 20 by 20, as dom demonstrated by protocol T, by the guidelines from society, and by some of these real-world evidence studies. Importance of early intensive treatment, to, so treat it early, treat it hard, and then you can get robust long-term improvements in vision, and you can reduce the treatment burden to these patients who are in the working age population. So it, that you can improve the quality of life in subsequent years. And when costs are not an issue, this is a kind of drug of choice for patients even with new onset DME. Thank you so much. So I think uh, there is enough data, in fact, uh, that uh, not only protocol D, but all these studies which uh, uh, Joyce also has mentioned, that today, percent is number one treatment of choice. And I don't think so even the retina specialists differ in this. In fact, I was uh, questioning a couple of uh, my friends in the US and all. Most of them have shifted and uh, uh, from, from uh, ranimizumab to aflibercept. In fact, more than 80% have shifted in DME. And uh, I personally don't think so that we should stress only in patients with low visual equity even in all grades, wheresoever we have to make a choice that we have to give anti -vegger. So the advantage low visual equity because there's enough to gain there. That is the only advantage. And even if you see protocol, uh, what Nishantra is doing, one year, two year, there's always an edge of aflibercept. Only thing is the, the quantum may differ, that's it. The area under curve anyway would be better, yeah. so it would be beneficial so, for the patients. So uh, Malika, you want to say something? Or? Yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to say is that when Mike. we, mm. in cases where there is a persistent, right from the beginning, if you give an injection and there is no response, mm. then of course it makes sense to give five monthly injections. But we should not call it loading dose because that has an implication that blindly you would be giving it irrespective. So the point is, if it is not responding, then you don't wait uh, for treat and extend or you don't wait for two monthly. You just give it monthly and then after five or six injections, because you know that now, then you can go to yeah, monthly. I agree because yes. I think uh, Nishant are presenting a data, of, uh, you know, of early intense treatment. Yeah, intensive treatment of those, because yeah. Uh, yeah. what he was pushing was three to five. And because he tends to say around 28, 30% gain by more than one line. And then if you don't give uh, five, then the, those you are denying one line gain to those yeah. uh, 20 per 30 percent. Yeah, the point so I wanted to touch, sir, was that you said, uh, I, for <laughs> I forget now what, what you were saying. Um, sir? Okay, I'll come back to it later. Sir, yeah. I just wanted to add one thing to what Dr. Lalit so said. Many, I, I just was saying, but how many of us actually practice this? You see, the early intensive treatment. We, most of us, I think, uh, are fond of giving only three injections, by and large. And, uh, and we do not mind, uh, in, especially in DME, giving PRN also, because diabetes being a multifactorial disease, it's not only uh, you know uh, one aspect playing a role, it's the control, lipids, hypertension, so many other factors are also there. So uh, most of us uh, practice three, but you have presented uh, enough evidence, that because one line is uh, five letters, and even uh, anatomically also similar, around uh, one third or so you are denying if you don't. Yes, Praveen? So I think uh, I would say that I prefer uh, treat and extend more in DME as compared to UNG because yeah. the underlying disease is not going to go. That is definitely there. I may not always give a five um, uh, intensive monthly injection, but I definitely give till you get start getting a four-wheel control. Once you start getting a four-wheel control, maybe then you can start extending. But uh, definitely more in favor of a prolonged treatment in diabetes. And I think we should also differentiate. This kind because of uh, re result that second year, the need for injection drastically comes down. Yes, yes. So which is a so major incentive. Is the, 
which is uh, which doesn't happen in uh, AMD. AMD. Yeah. So, so AMD you is get a different. Reference means you start from ABCD again. Yes, yes, yes. So the point so which so basically, uh, uh, Praveen, it's not treat and extend at all in DME, because your injection in second year is just coming to two to three or four, two to between two to four. So it's not treat and extend really in that sense what we talk in AMD. So. Yeah, that is different, but it is not a treat yeah, and extend. You can't call it. Yeah. And in third year, you have even fewer injections. So it's not really a treat and extend. So what we were talking was the early aggressive treatment, uh, which in fact uh, very nicely brought out also by Malika, that if you have these cases, which we find majority in our population, I think we should not be counting that three here. That is what basically, I think we have to be aggressive and aggressively treat till we get either rid of that or we switch them. You yes. see, that is the question. But aggressive means no, th just three, I think that is where it got stuck from AMD or all the trial. So I think uh, Nishant did uh, make a point I, about I that. I agree with you, Mangat, the term loading dose, uh, generally with AMD, yes, yes. but here it's uh, because the number of injections in the second year, 2.7 or what he uh, suggested, it is just, uh, you know, uh, more like PRN or, uh, or uh, these are the average number of injections he is saying. So one, uh, can I make a point? We actually don't want to, you know, go into an intensive therapy believing that the patient will not be able to afford. Mm -hmm. But over time, when we have started off offering, uh, offering aflibercept, actually in suburban areas yes. also, the number of patients taking aflibercept is currently around 20-25%. So, mm -hmm. and a lot of these patients with intensive ther therapy, they are happier off in the second or third year. So Sir, we should yes, hide. Uh, Sir, I remember uh, the point they, which they were, yeah. <laughs> so you, had, forget, ma <laughs> you had made a list now. Yeah. Yeah. So you had mentioned that even in mild DME you would prefer. So I, I, no, no, I because I said yeah, that definitely, uh, yeah. definitely. Even with patients who have good vision, in case we have decided to give. Yes, exactly. Because we we know that uh, unless affordability, initial affordability is a problem, because we know that it will last longer. So even if we give another drug, we may have to repeat after six weeks. Whereas if we give this, we may or may not have to repeat after three months. So even the durability is a re reason. Yeah, durability uh, is a very good reason. Yeah. Initial, you see, if patient gains, na, then he does not mind. Sir, uh, the problem comes if patient does not gain. If you show the benefit, then he will afford it. That yeah. is, sir, just uh, one small yeah, point. Uh, building on what uh, he just said, uh, that many often, uh, you know, very often the doctor himself or herself gives up and saying that, okay, the couple of first couple of injections have not worked, so the third probably won't work, and then I don't want to subject the patient to further injection. But not only early intensive, but even late intensive therapy will also That's work. That's what and he that is, the yeah. third so three late, lines he's told. So it is a chronic is disease, and then it requires chronic treatment, and that is the point that we want to drive across uh, through the discussion. Raja? So overall, yeah, I would say that there are a couple of points which are coming up where we all agree. There are some points where there is still some difference of opinion. Where we all agree is if someone is recommending a patient a less aggressive treatment, at least in the first six months based on the data, uh, that is gross injustice to the patient. And uh, doctor cannot give up in, in the early stages of the disease that you have not got six by six vision, so there's no point giving any further treatment. What Nishant's graphs showed were improvements in vision, the letters of gain. They were not six by six, the percentage were getting six by six. So we should be extremely careful because in spite of, I know retina fellows after doing retina fellowship, being in practice, they come back on WhatsApp with questions, this patient has not achieved six by six, uh, patient is very unhappy, uh, should I give further injections? So I, it, this is a f two years of fellowship training and this is nth number of uh, debate. But the point is, if we do not treat aggressively, which I don't want to use the word aggressively, but it's, it's a scientific term. There is a need for treatment, zero tolerance in the first six months. And obviously, Dr. Malika mentioned a point and Dr. Mangat also agrees that if a patient has achieved six by six and there is no fluid, Nishan mentioned in his slide, obviously you don't have to give injection at that particular point of time. But we all agree that we cannot tolerate any fluid in the first six months and data shows that beyond six months, you may be able to tolerate some fluid as long as there is no drop in vision. 
that's very important but the biggest challenge in spite of having years and years of anti vegf years and years of debate what the data shows is that it's not as if the doctors don't want to treat the patients with injections uh, aditya kelkar's publication which i was uh, you know showed yesterday real world data approximately 40% of patients do not even take the second injection so look at the steep fall someone who is requiring a second injection 60% of them don't take the second injection so where are we in terms of second year and third year first year itself first month itself we have lost the battle one of the uh, ways is uh, you know what dr devulal was mentioning aflibercept being affordable and other drugs also becoming affordable but the way we communicate to the patient also makes a difference. I think Dr. Lalit mm. mentioned about, uh, you know, all India data. He would have liked to see Indian data also being presented. I think yeah, I was talking to Raja that, that you see if countries like Australia with very less number of uh, population and patients, they can project and uh, be imported. Why can't BRSI or we also collect data at least yes. from five, seven major institutions who have sizable amount of work so that uh, tomorrow Nishant quotes our work also. Which is very important. Yeah. It's our prestige. Yeah, yeah. you were making yeah. a point. Yeah, hi. Uh, so no, actually, I wanted to just discuss one point about the, uh, you know, about the opinion of the panel and everybody here. So uh, sometimes even after an aggressive Rest treatment, you, you would you. have uh, patients who will have that little bit of fluid or little bit of CME, and their vision also improves, but then the OCT is not very great. And uh, you do have at the back of your mind that you want to switch, or even otherwise, if you plan to switch for whatever reasons. So. Uh, how many of you practically feel that, you know, you see, traditionally we just had Radizumab and, uh, you know, Ozodex as a switching factor. And so how many of you do you feel that, okay, you would first switch to aflibercept now and not uh, so Ozodex? So my that? decision is primarily based on not only OCT. Right. It's based on vision and OCT. Yeah, yeah, both, both. Yeah. yeah. I'm just talking about switching. So, so practically switching from ranibizumab to aflibercept should be, uh, I mean, actually a universal because mm -hmm. steroid has side effects as well. And uh, it is not uh, superior in drying effect even. So what is the advantage of switch? steroid? I think should be at least in DME should be a last resort when you have tried aflibercept say five times or three times. Only then you would because you're taking some side effects including cataract, mm -hmm. raised IOP. So there's no benefit. So unless there is a content indication like recent CVA or and you know. Other and things. there are some studies which have also and personal experience which shows that even if anatomical results are the same between the two, the patient's uh, subjective visual response is much superior to anti-VEGF than yeah, to steroid. Yeah. And this we see repeatedly. Not so only objective visual acuity outcome, but subjectively patient always says, no, this was better, even if your OCT is similar. But so even you, OCT, I find, is better. So if I feel the same. vision is improving with, the, uh, with one particular drug, then there is no point in switching it, even if the OCT has some residual fluid, mm -hmm. because our main guide is the vision. Yes, if you are asking about VRSI data, I mean, we didn't specify the parameters of a case scenario when they are going to switch. You know, vision is improving or not improving, OCT is improving, but there's still fluid. Uh, in two injections, almost 50% of them switch if there is no improvement, compared to the, all the protocol data mm. where they wait for at least five injections. In India, we have a lower threshold. And by third injection, if there is no improvement, if there is a reason to switch, almost everyone switches. And they do not wait for five injections. And the other thing is, will you switch between anti of injections? Or will you switch between, if you have given anti everyone starts with anti -VEGF. Will you give steroid? A almost everyone jumped in that survey. They chose steroid instead of switching between anti yeah. That's the yeah. Yeah. Sir, Just building on what you just said, uh, sometimes improvements, especially in chronic cases, can actually continue over two years. So continuing with the same drug also may make sense in many of these. If you've started off with aflibercept and you've seen moderate or minimal improvements every time, it might even continue, and then the pers person uh, can actually achieve yeah, six actually weeks. Practically vision. switching yeah. over to aflibercept now has become much easier, especially with the programs yeah, and all. But earlier, obviously, actually, Raja presented the difficult. data, yeah. which was uh, when aflibercept was very expensive. Yeah. True. And yeah. that is the time this survey was done. done. And so everybody switched very fast. So after aflibercept, probably the things have changed. Once it became affordable, that's a good point. Exactly that survey so that needs to be uh, conducted would, yeah. again. Yeah, and yeah, then that was exactly yeah. my question: was that how 
frequently are we switching yeah, I agree so FLE percept in our usage was uh, you know around 10 15 percent now it is more than 85 percent yeah. primarily because of affordability yeah. previously it was 60,000 plus now it is exactly. costing economically also it makes sense it's to you know almost. start and uh, start and finish off with FLE percept and Just then then the option of uh, switching comes mm -hmm. to only steroid. There's no yeah. sense to go back to ranimizumab or yeah. this thing. So, just so to I, for one, uh, will agree with what was uh, being just said. Just to add, uh, Gagan, one more thing. I think Eflibercept is definitely the drug of choice now for DNA, even for mild, because it reduces the number of injections. But just to highlight, you know, even in protocol T, after the end of uh, 48 weeks, 30 yeah, to 40 percent of the patients, they required some rescue laser therapy. So we also have to keep in mind that, you know, some parafoveal, uh, if there is a leakage, we can also use some laser that will also further reduce the number of injections in the long term. So probably you can reduce yeah, the number. No, that is true. I think most of us, most of us, uh, it's not rescue, it's basically uh, just a reduction of injections. All of us, I think, uh, after a couple of injections, do laser, do uh, FA and identify the areas which can be treated by laser. That is okay. But the thrust of today's talk was... Uh, take away from uh, the presenters three to five, three to five, because uh, mind mein jo ingrained hai wo three hai. Mm -hmm. So wo jo peak was ne dikhaya na, wo yahan te ye hai, to peak wahan pe jata hai. So that is what is, uh, what we learned today, that to maximize in all the three sets, what he labeled that poor responders still, then maximum responders, you get more one line or 28%. I think that is what I think uh, the takeaway from this that we should, and as Raja says, it is the early treatment, intense treatment that should be offered to this patient. And nowadays, because it's economically more viable, we can easily, because our counseling makes the whole impact. What you talk in the first uh, go with the patient, because that time you have to spend more time, and patient, I think, will be compliant if you tell him economically, visually, anatomically, it makes sense. Sir, just to also add, uh, Dr. Nishad made a very important point. If the vision is not improving to look for the uh, structural abnormality, deposition of heart, probably we can do that before starting the treatment only. You can do an OCT, angio, or see the deposition of heart exudates and inform the patient accordingly. Yeah, last sir, point. Yes, yeah. sir, just, uh, you know, one point that helps in counseling is that treat, telling them, because the, the first question that a patient asks is how many injections and why should I take? So the point that we generally make is that diabetes is a lifelong decision. So I think the first question should be directed at your physician that why do I have to yeah. take medicines for life? We are presuming so that, you see, we will yeah. take care of those five factors, uh, hemoglobin, mm -hmm. diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. We presume that this audience is aware <laughs> of this and should not forget uh, the importance of what they were saying. No, and sir, that but because they, want, this only that they because don't want lifelong injections, but then why are you taking lifelong everybody. therapy for diabetes? So <laughs> because these are controlled data what you see, these injections are not lifelong. All the studies have shown that after two years you hardly need. Yeah. No, that's sir. True. That, that's true. But All sometimes... Uh, so on. I think uh, we, uh, we, we did learn a lot from uh, uh, Nishant as well as Dai's presentations. And uh, hopefully most of us should come back with our experiences and uh, we'll request Raja and VRSI to have more of Indian data also. And I'll request Bayer to help us in this collection of data so that uh, we can have performance and then request Nishan to present our data there. Thanks uh, to uh, all the panelists and the uh, Bayer group for having us here.